So I learned as a young student that repetition is the father of all learning. When I didn't understand what a teacher was trying to show me, I would just keep repeating it and memorizing it until eventually I would say, I get it! So I want to take a moment to remember where we've been in about six weeks in studying about the new birth. You remember that we started out by learning that uh, the new birth is the only way of entering the kingdom of God. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we learn that it comes, the new birth comes with a guarantee. Jesus said, you'll never lose it. Once you have it, God will not, you cannot unlearn or or lose your salvation. Because Jesus said, I give to them eternal life and they shall never perish and nobody can pluck you out of the Father's hands. We also learn that the new birth is marked supremely by the characteristic of love for God and for others. And then the last couple of weeks we've been diving into the reality that the new birth creates the new you. Or another way that the New Testament describes it is that a new self has been created in the image of God our Father. So there's a brand new you to celebrate. The problem is, although the new you has displaced the old you, which is about as dark as you could imagine, as damnable as anyone could ever conceive, As much as the new birth has displaced the old you, the old you is still there, fighting against the spirit who has given birth to the new you internally. So we landed last week by studying one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, and I told you that in that that favorite chapter of mine is that Key verse, verse number 17, where we're told, Paul says, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, let me just review for you last week. We said the new creation has, in the first part of the chapter, in first 13 verses, has four characteristics. I'm not going to preach them all over again, I promise. I'm going to just remind you that we said the new you comes with a new hope. And the new hope that we possess as God's children is the resurrection. Because this body is a tent in which we temporarily dwell and it will be folded up one day. But when it does, we have a house built by God's own hand, eternal in the heavens. So we're, the, the new you can always be filled with great hope. And number two, the new you has the right to always be encouraged, to be full of courage. And the courage, of course, comes if you remember. I I told you I'm trying not to preach the sermon all over again. If you want to listen to it, you can go back and find it online. The courage that we have every day comes from the knowledge and confidence that God is at work just as he says he was. Or he is. And then we said in verses 6 through 10, we have a new vision. Or I might say a new goal. And our new goal is to please the Lord. And in, in pleasing the Lord, we will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. How's it going to happen? I don't know. Does God have big screens in heaven? I don't know. Have some of these projectors that we use on Sunday morning? I don't know. But it says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for what we have done in these bodies, good or bad. And of course, our passion is that we want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And then the last thing that I told you last week was that we have a new motive. And our new motive is, I haven't lost you yet, have I? Do you remember this? I said, we are so convinced of the glory and greatness of God that we can't keep our mouth shut. We are bound to persuade others because we know the terror of the Lord. We know the fear of God. We know his glory and power. And so we're so convinced that we are going to, we're going to do our best to convince you by persuading you that 
he is as wonderful as he says he is. So for this morning now, I want to jump back into that same chapter. Grab your Bibles and open them to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want to look at uh, the new you part two. Pastor Brad reminded me that that rhymes. The new you part two. Doesn't mean anything. They didn't think it was as funny, Brad, as I did. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to begin reading at verse number 14. I'm going to look at the four remaining evidences of the new you, who you should be, who you are in Christ, how he has created you. And let me remind you that the reading of God's word is more important than anything we have to say about it because it is God's word that is faithful, trustworthy, and able to produce faith in the hearts of those who are listening to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we view no one according to the flesh. Even though we once saw Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Again, he says, second time in this chapter, it's God who's done all this. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us. You hear that? He gave us. The ministry of reconciliation. What is the ministry of reconciliation? That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. He's poised to forgive them. And entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We beseech you, we implore you, we beg of you. This is urgent. On behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Then that famous verse, perhaps more than any other verse in all the New Testament. I learned it early. I love it now more than I ever have. For our sake, he that is God made him that is Christ to be sin who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so let me show you the remainder evidences of the new creation that he has made. And I'm sure you're already ahead of me in verses 14 and 15. You've been able to conclude that my next point has to be, I have a new heart. How could you talk about the love of God without thinking that God has installed in us a new heart? So we have a new mind, the Bible says. We have the mind of Christ. And we have a new heart. The love of God has installed itself in us that adds up to a new you. You look wonderful. By the way, the love of God, the love of Christ controls us. Now notice carefully in the text, will you? Uh, I didn't read it this morning, but back in about verse number 11 and 12, he talks about the terror of the Lord or the fear of God. You cannot honestly embrace your Bible unless you accept it in its entirety. And the Bible teaches as much the fear of God as it does the love of God. But woe to the Christian who parks more than they need to on one or the other. To be perfectly balanced, you must accept and acknowledge the fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom. That is, we are convinced of his greatness and glory and we stand in reverence and awe of him, knowing how powerful he is. That is, we borrow our next breath from him. He's all-powerful, God the Almighty. But if all you do is tell people they need to be afraid of God without installing in their hearts the transformative, stunning love of God, you've ripped up the balance of the Bible. So Paul says, the love of Christ controls us. So let me go on a little bit of a tangent, but I need you to follow me carefully down this bunny trail. And it is that I think to be a healthy Christian and a growing Christian, 
you have to learn to practice a certain level of self-awareness of reading the culture of your mind or the state of your soul. The Bible calls it examining yourself. So you need to be able to judge by the help of the Holy Spirit before God what's really going on in your soul. I could hear myself making these confessions, Lord, but am I living them out? Do I practice what I say I believe in my life? You have to submit yourself humbly to God and say, you go ahead and show me the truth about me. And what does this text say? Something or someone controls you. Something or someone has seized you. What is it? I know what it's like to be seized for a good period of time by fear. I know what it's like to be seized for a good period of time by regret. I know what it's like to be seized for a good period of time by dark experiences and memories through which I have passed. But Paul says the only force and power that ought to grip your heart and hold you in its strong grasp is the love of Christ. So he says the love of Christ should be the guiding, controlling force of your life. Children of God, people of God, family of God. Can you sit here this morning and say before God as I ask him to show me if his love is controlling me, he's affirming it or saying, you need to seek me humbly in prayer that I will be able to install this in your life. Isn't it interesting? As soon as he talks about the love of God, he talks about the death of Christ because the death of Christ is the single greatest evidence of the love of God. He died for all. All have died because we have all sinned. So Christ died for all that those who live, by the way, that's how we live. We live in Jesus and we live through Jesus. Because of his presence, he abides in us. He died for all that those who live, watch this carefully, we live only when we have died with him. But we no longer live for ourselves, this text says. That's like a slap in the face of this modern world that tells you you are the God of your own destiny, the Lord of your own life. You have right to your own body and mind and soul when the Bible says that believers no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sakes died. So here's how I think it looks. You can measure the health of your soul by whether or not you are living for the one who died for you. So I've translated in my life this way. The new self isn't focused on itself, but on Christ. That's not to undermine the importance of taking care of your soul. I happen to believe that the church should be best at counseling people on how to grow emotionally beyond traumatic, devastating events or memories or experiences in their life. I happen to believe that the church ought to be uh, the, the experts in helping people to live life the way God planned it to be because Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So how does that work when I have brokenness buried deep in my life? The simple answer, it is by taking care of your soul according to the gospel preaching the gospel to yourself and learning more of what it means and facing your fears. But let me say it again. The new self isn't focused on itself. It's focused on Christ. And if you want to experience life and liberty and spiritual health, get your eyes off yourself and onto Christ. Is what he says. We don't live for ourselves. We're walking this planet hoping in every act in every word, in every thought. How can we honor God? How can we live for Christ? How can we please the Lord? What can we do to expand his kingdom? And I better move on and show you the second thing that is equally obvious to me in verses uh, 16 and 17. Not only do I have a new heart, I have new eyes. Paul talks about the new man being able to see from a different perspective. Because he says... I once regarded Christ 
as a fraud and a religious fanatic that needed to die. But there was a transformation in my understanding of who Christ is, and now he's Lord of all. And Paul was giving his life for the sake of the gospel. <clears throat> he makes the same observation of other human beings. I don't regard or view anyone from the viewpoint of my flesh, that is, through the eyes of what I can see, and what I think about their position, their looks, etc. Et I see every individual as a potential new creation in Christ. I see even the lowest struggling humanity as a potential trophy of God's amazing grace. Imagine the prejudice that would be eradicated in the world if we could adopt the attitude of Christ, of Paul, that I don't see you anymore through the eyes of my limited flesh, but through the gift of grace that has been bestowed upon you. Perspective is everything. The world is caught right now in a fight. They want to blame it all on religion. They try to keep saying religion is the fault. It isn't, religion isn't the fault. It's, it's hatred and prejudice. But imagine churches that are able to view the opponents of the gospel like Muslims with the eyes of love, the eyes of Christ. We might just win some Muslims to Jesus. Christians get angry and name call atheists I see it every day on Facebook, and I think you're no representative of Christ because you should view even the atheist who hates God through the eyes of Christ that he is a potential child of God, a new creation. Pretty amazing. He's, he's simply saying, we need to learn to see each other the way God sees you. I think that's pretty cool. How does God see you? Through the love of Christ. He's reconciling you. I want to say it again. Perspective is everything. How you see the world matters. So I told you last week I celebrated my 56th birthday. And um, uh, I remember when I turned 50, my oldest brother said, Hey, Bartlett, don't think of yourself as old now. I wondered why he gave me that advice. Because everybody that pro crosses that mark, 50 years of age, tend to see themselves getting older now. Maybe it's, it's, a, it's a mindset. Well, last Sunday, a sweet spiritual mother from this church sent me a note on my birthday and said, think of your life as a ball game. You're just passing second base. <laughs> I thought that was just excellent. I'm still in the game, and I've got a long way to go to run the race of faith. That's what Paul's doing. Take the time to reshape how you're viewing things from God's perspective, and you will be filled with great encouragement. Let me show you thirdly, the seventh evidence of the new birth is I have a new ministry. That's in verses 18 through 20. I wrestled with not using the word ministry and using its more common synonym, which is the word service. But I stuck with the word ministry because it's in the text, and most of you sit there and think Derek is the one who's been called to the ministry when this text says every one of you are ministers. All of you have been called to service. Now go from preaching to stepping on toes. If you are a follower of Christ and you are not serving him, I doubt seriously, you do not have the joy of the Lord. You do not have his blessing and approval. He gave you a... T we look at people who are very talented and they're not using their abilities and we feel very sad. Does that woman not realize what she could accomplish? But here she is sitting on her laurels. It hurts us, doesn't it? Imagine what it must feel like to God when he sees a particular talent that he deposited in your life, but you're sitting on it and not using it for his glory. Now the text tells us what, what the gift is, what the service is. The service is God reconciled us to himself and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. He reconciled us and then employs us in his service to reconcile others. It's vital that you listen carefully to me because if you mess up this biblical order, 
you will take on unnecessary guilt. You are not commanded by God to reconcile anybody to God because you can't, only God can, and he will do it and has done it through Christ. But he has committed to you the ministry of reconciliation. I told you before that that word reconciliation is one of my favorites in the Bible. Uh, It appears about 10 times only. It's not really that common in the New Testament. It was used almost exclusively by Paul, I think, nine out of 10 times. It's used five times in Corinthians, and the rest are all in Romans. And the word means for warring factions, to lay down arms, and to reconcile, listen, relationally. The reason I love Paul's use of the word reconciliation is because it highlights the primary nature of Christianity. Christianity is not a to-do list. It's not a list of legalistic responsibilities. Christianity is an invitation to relationship with God. And in this case, the one who was offended made every effort to reconcile with us. And he's, what is he doing? He's inviting us into a relationship. I think the greatest waste this coming week from the people sitting in this church is the fact that God sits in longing for your soul in waiting for your voice, but you will not lean into his heart. You will not press into what he's teaching you and saying to you. You will not take the time to break from your crazy busy life And sit quietly in his presence and say, speak, Lord. I have your word open. My ears are open. Show me how I'm supposed to live. Teach me how to grow. Teach me how to be obedient to you. Now notice what he says. The ministry of reconciliation entrusted to us is being faithful to the message. He has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Christianity is a relationship, but at its core is faithfulness to what is already delivered to us through the apostles recorded in Scripture, the Bible. Christianity is not all the bells and whistles in formalized religion, the kneeling and the standing and the crossings and the lighting of candles, saying of prayers. You could, you could be as pagan as the greatest pagan on earth, Conduct all those exercises in your heart. Never know God. Because Christianity is a relationship and the message is spelled out for us in the Bible. Listen, God is faithful to us, then we need to be faithful to his message, which is the only means of keeping us faithful to him. You strip the message away and we lose our fellowship with our God. So what does he say? He's committed. Our service on earth is to be committed to the ministry of reconciliation. That means that we have to tell people that God wants to live in relationship. And you do it as an ambassador. I think that's one of the coolest concepts in the New Testament. Every Christian in this room is an ambassador. You know what an ambassador does, don't you? An ambassador ambassador incarnates the authority of the king they represent to the people the king wishes to know. That is, we speak the words of the king and represent the character of the king. So to properly understand the word ambassador, you had to know what Paul knew about it in the first century. And Paul would see it from a Roman perspective because the Romans, Romans were the ruling empire of the day, and they basically had two ways of seeing an ambassador. The first was that the provinces already conquered by Rome would be managed either by numerous senators or an emperor directly. The the peaceful provinces would be ruled by the senators. The ones that were tumultuous and chaotic would be ruled by the emperor, and the person who represented the emperor directly to the provinces that were in distress is called an ambassador. So Paul means to say, 
until it dawns on you that the very authority of Christ is what has commissioned you to go into all the world and preach the gospel, you don't know what it means to be an ambassador. The second way that it was used is that there were provinces that uh, Rome had its eye on but were, were in distress and they were deteriorating, and Rome would send six or eight ambassadors to broker a peace and work out the details of the cooperation between Rome and the country where the people dwelt. And so that's an ambassador. So here's what he's saying, friends. I tried hard to remind you, don't cross the line. It is God alone who can reconcile others to himself. If you take upon yourself the responsibility to try and uh, preach or convince someone into heaven, you'll lose them. You'll turn them off. God does the reconciling. But this passage carefully balances out that God has chosen a human agency. And it is the church's assignment, mandate, commission, and responsibility to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. And if we don't do that, we're failing to be an ambassador. I can't think of a higher privilege than representing Jesus the King as his ambassador to those who need to know him and understand who he is. By the way, there are some of you in this room that are magnificent ambassadors. I'm not insulting the rest of you. I don't know everybody personally. But when I get to sit knee to knee with you at dinner and listen to your life, you know what I think? Whoa! What great ambassadors for Christ! I'm honored to be your under-shepherd. And I want to do everything I can to fuel your faith so that you'll keep representing Christ with the high class he deserves. Many of you are classy Christians, and I'm applauding you today. And I'm saying, keep it up. Keep going. God's using you, and he's using you just as he said he would. I'm, I'm finished with this last one. It's in verse number 21. So let me remind you, because of the new creation in me, I have a new hope, new courage, new goal, new motive. I have a new heart, new eyes, new ministry, and I have a new story. It's very important you hear what I'm saying here. In verse number 21, after telling the Corinthians that they were ambassadors for Christ, they've been committed to the ministry of reconciliation and the message of the gospel in Christ, he then does something that seems at first to be out of place. Because when you read verse 21, it doesn't seem to fit the, the logic that he's using throughout the text until it dawned on me this past week. This is Paul personalizing the gospel. Do you understand what I'm saying? Until you see that your story on earth has been interrupted, intersected, and transformed by the gospel, you don't really understand the gospel until the gospel is rewriting the story of your life, you really haven't embraced the gospel. You really haven't received it by faith. I want to encourage some of you. I'm 56, and the story, the story is still transforming my story. My story didn't start out like yours. We are all different. When I think, when I stand on this platform some Sunday mornings, I look out at you and I think every end of the globe is represented in this, in this church. And every life matters to God. And every story was planned by him. And he knows every detail and how to weave it together for his honor and for the good of the gospel. And he took a messed up screwed up young man that I was and said, I'm going to rewrite your story. The ending is going to be different than the beginning, but I need something from you. I need you to see yourself in the story. What do you mean, Lord? Notice the personal pronouns that he uses. For your sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin. He personalizes it. So what he is saying is, for Brad's sake. Is that not awesome, Brad? Yes. For Brad's sake. 
God made Christ to become Brad's guilt of sin and David's and Drew's and Derek's and yours until you, until you write yourself into the story, the gospel has not exploded in your heart yet. It's what Augustine said. God loves each of us as if there was only one of us. Meaning, if you were the only sinner on earth, Christ would have come and did what he did at the cross to reconcile you to the Father. <laughs> oh, man, somebody say, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody, please. For you, read yourself in the story. What is it for your sake? I took your place of death and guilt and judgment and sin. I took your place. I stood in your place. I said, let him go. Let her go. Father, release them. I will take their sin. But I only, Jesus said, I only want one thing from you, Father. I want you to take your utter moral and spiritual perfection and holiness. And I want you to deposit it in their life. I want you to implant your very nature in them. And the Father said, done. Done. The cross is about God saying to you personally, I'm, I'm taking your place. Have you made it that personal? My story as I know it, would have destroyed me if it were not for the gospel. And now when I have those dark days and my, story, my old story comes press, you know what I do? I go back to the new story in Christ. And I preach the gospel to myself and say, but I am created in the image of God and I am loved by him and his spirit lives in me and I am in Christ and on and on I can go until finally the dark feelings from the old memories start to disappear. Today is your day to be born again and become the new you, the new self in Christ. And stop living for yourself and start living for Christ and for his honor. Father, I do appreciate love, respect. So I'm so fired up this morning as I'm preaching about ambassadors because I know so many in this church. And April came home yesterday saying to me there are so many amazing people in this con congregation that we thank you for the way that Christ in all of his beauty and glory is represented in the lives of your people. Now, Lord, hold our feet to the fire in being the best ambassador that we can be. Engage us in the work. Fill us with your spirit and use us for your name's sake and for your honor. And I plead with you, Holy Spirit, Please stretch yourself out across this audience like a blanket until everyone that is not born again will be born from above today by the visitation of your Holy Spirit. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.